What I want to do today is I want to close the loop. Okay, so when I put courses together, I sort of think of them almost as like a playlist. And a really good playlist is the one you start wanting playing from the beginning, right when you end it. So we've been talking about these unknown ID distributions over, over uh, inputs and algorithms that are good for them. I want to connect that to our very first topic, which is instance optimality. Okay. So let me remind you about instance optimality. So this means you're basically optimal, at least up to a constant factor, input by input. Okay, so it's the strongest possible, least controversial notion of optimality. So whatever your cost measure, algorithm A is alpha instance optimal. If for every algorithm B and every input Z, you're within an alpha factor of the cost of B on Z. Okay? So provided alpha is reasonably small, this is a super, super strong guarantee. Really the best you could hope for. So strong, in fact, that often these algorithms don't exist. Okay? And so we talked about, at least for values of alpha, that are interesting. Okay, so this is, we mentioned a couple relaxations, like throwing in the alpha, and then the other relaxation we mentioned, which is the one I'm really going to focus on today, is you can say, well, you know, maybe our algorithm A isn't as good as every single other algorithm on every single input, but maybe it's as good as every other reasonable algorithm, or every other natural algorithm B on every single input. Okay? So the relaxation is restrict B, the competing algorithm, to a subclass, script C, of natural algorithms. Okay? So that's an idea. But then, of course, you know, the question, uh, and in fact, really, we sort of did this when we talked about 2D maxima. So this is way back in the very first week of the class. We observed that this definition is problematic because this one, you know, so you're given a point set, you're trying to compute the maxima, uh, the Pareto optimal points, and, you know, for a given input Z, there exists an algorithm which is basically memorized the input of that input Z. And the way we got around that is we kind of said, well, those algorithms are unreasonable. Let's only look at algorithms which don't memorize the input in the sense that their running time, or at least our running time analysis, is independent of the order in which the points are presented. Okay, so effectively, for 2D maxima, we define script C as the order oblivious algorithms B. Okay, so that's what we were doing back then. Now, in general, for a general problem, there's this question of, you know, wh how, what should C be? Okay, so what other algorithms B should we be competing with? So what's a, what's a good, well-motivated choice for the set C? Okay. And clearly, what we're looking for is we're looking for sort of a sweet spot. So on the one hand, C should be small enough that we can prove something interesting. Okay? So that we can actually prove an instance automatic result for some algorithm, which is nice. On the other hand, you know, subject to that, we want it to be as large as possible, as rich as possible, encompassing everything we might plausibly implement. So by doing the analysis, we're hoping to kind of say, well, among everything we could imagine actually implementing, here is the best one, or here's a few ones that are kind of as good as it could get within that class. And so what I want to point out, and sort of the main conceptual point of this lecture, is that all of our discussions about, you know, sort of unknown underlying distributions motivates a way to define these sets script C. And so unlike um, the previous three or four lectures where we were literally assuming that there was a distribution over the inputs and we proceeded to analyze algorithms according to that assumption, here we're going to think right now temporarily about distributions over inputs only as a thought experiment, okay, only to define the set C. Okay, so in this lecture, just, I mean, I know I'm getting ahead of ourselves, but just to clarify, this lecture we will never actually do average case analysis. We will never actually take expectations over an input. Okay, we're only going to look at distributions over inputs to define the set C. Then once we have this set of competitor algorithms, we're going to look for an instance optimality guarantee in this sense. Okay. All right, so how do we do this? Well, again, so just temporarily, suppose there was a distribution over inputs. Okay. 
And maybe we don't know what it is, maybe it's unknown, but we, you know, like in many lectures we've seen, we have some set of distributions where the, which, which might be governing the input. Okay. So set of distributions over inputs. And again, in sort of a different context, we've seen many examples of what these sets might look like. So in smooth analysis, this would be, for example, you know, point masses slightly perturbed or sufficiently diffuse distributions. Uh, when we're, like when we were talking about local search, when we were talking about hashing, this would be all distributions that have enough randomness in the sense that we defined in that lecture. Uh, so in self-improving algorithms, when we talked about sorting, there we were assuming that the different entries of the array were independent. So we were thinking about all distributions subject to being independent across different, uh, different array elements. And when we talked about pricing algorithms a couple lectures ago, we had this regularity notion, for example, saying that this revenue curve was concave. But other than that, we made no assumptions. So all of those are examples of families of distributions, capital D. Okay. And again, the point is, you know, often it's plausible that you know something about the distributions on a course level, about the inputs, but you don't really want to assume something like a parametric form, that they're Gaussian or that they're uniform or something like that. Okay, so all of these are examples of what these kinds of families of distributions look like. All right, so in previous examples, we were thinking of inputs as literally being drawn from that distribution, but now let's just use a set of distributions to define a set of algorithms. So, once you've fixed a set of distributions, define the corresponding set of algorithms, C sub D, as all of the algorithms that arise as optimal algorithms for these sets of distributions. Okay. So this is a family of distributions. This is going to be a family of algorithms. Which are the algorithms? Well, you just range over the distributions. In your head, you ask, Okay, well, what if inputs were drawn from some distribution capital F? What would I do? There'd be some algorithm A, which is the best of all algorithms in expectation over that distribution F. You put that in this set. Then you move on to the next distribution in script D. You ask the same question. You get a different algorithm. You put that algorithm in this set, and so on. Okay, so you just iterate through all these distributions, look at all the corresponding optimal algorithms, and that's your set. So A optimal for some distribution, F in D. And just to clarify, so what do I mean by optimal? Well, once you've fixed a distribution, remember, then there's an unequivocal notion of what it means to be optimal. You just look at the expected cost of the algorithm on the distribution. So every algorithm has this one number attached to it, it's expected cost. Some algorithm has the smallest expected cost, that's the optimum, okay? So minimizing the expectation with respect to the distribution F, of the cost of A over a random input Z drawn from the distribution F. Is a question? How does this prevent um, an algorithm which like checks if the input is um, crazy and like outputs some, like memorizes some input for which you wouldn't consider in your distribution um, and then is optimal on that, that crazy input but is also optimal on D? Uh, well, so it might be hard to simultaneously be optimal on a crazy input and be optimal for D, right? I mean, because basically, so what it, so if you memorize an input, what do you do? Basically, the first thing you have to do is you have to check that the input actually is, so we insist that you're correct on every input generally, mm -hmm. right? So if you've guessed an input to try to be fast, the first thing you have to do is check if that's it, right? And then, so you waste some time checking, and then, you have, and then if, it, you know, if that's never the case, right? So imagine it's a distribution where that's a very unlikely input. Right, you just always spend this time checking for it, which is a waste of time, and then you have to default to some algorithm anyways. So you'd be much better off just using that algorithm. Yeah. So there's this inherent trade-off. I mean, so that's, the, that's, always the, that's always the issue, right? So in, with algorithms, is if you're gonna be faster on some inputs, you're generally gonna be faster on others, or slower on others, right? If you can be faster on every single input, just do it, right? So really thinking about the Pareto frontier of algorithms where it's all about trade-offs between different inputs, and then a distribution lets you sort of reason about how to make those trade-offs, which is just using the expectation. Okay. All right, so is this clear? This is actually, I mean, so it's sort of, this is an important point, okay? So uh, the question was, how do you come up with a family of algorithms that you might want to compete with? And so what we're doing is, it, is we're, we're saying, well, let's reduce it to a family of distributions over inputs that you think, you know, might describe the world. And why don't you just try to compete with every algorithm that arises as an optimal one for one of those distributions, okay? So it reduces choosing script C to choosing script D, okay? 
Okay, and so here's sort of the, here's the formal connection between an unknown underlying distribution and instance optimality. And it's very simple, you know, it's almost trivial, but it's sort of one of the key points of the lecture, so let me just, you know, just do it. So it's not lost in anyone. So suppose you have an algorithm, and it's instance optimal with respect to a set of algorithms like this. Okay, so script C sub script D with some constant alpha, then for all distributions in your set, algorithm A is almost as good as the best for this distribution capital F. Meaning if I look at the expected cost of algorithm A on a random input drawn from F, this is the most alpha times the expected cost of the optimal algorithm for f, again evaluated on a random input drawn from f. Okay? And the point I want to emphasize here is that on the left hand side, this algorithm A, this is independence of distribution f. Okay? So this is like uh, when we had results where basically you knew the set of distributions, like so for example you knew it was ID or you knew it was regular or whatever, and the algorithm could depend on that information about the set of distributions, but it couldn't be tailored to the particular distribution. By contrast, what we're competing with over here, op sub f, this is tailored to f. Okay? So another way to think about this guarantee, and so when, you know, when I first introduced the notion of hybrid models, interpolations between worst and average case analysis, this is exactly the kind of inequality we had on the board. So one way to think about this is you know, compare two different scenarios. One, I tell you the distribution of inputs, then you get to pick whatever algorithm you want. Of course, you'll pick the optimal algorithm. Or in the much more unfair world, I don't tell you the distribution, I force you to first pick the algorithm, and then I show you the distribution, constrained only by the fact of the distribution being in script D. So if there's an instance optimal algorithm, then that says you actually lose only a factor of alpha in these two worlds. Clearly, you're only worse, right, if you have to choose the algorithm without knowing the distribution, but there's some sort of way to hedge your bets, okay? If there's an instance optimal algorithm, you're simultaneously near optimal no matter what f is, okay? So it's sort of robustly near optimal as long as you believe that the distribution uh, comes from script D, okay? So this is the claim. All right, so if your alpha instance optimal with respect to this class of algorithms, then your, average, your, your alpha approximate on every expectation from script D. The question in the back. So while it doesn't actually affect the result that you just proved, this script C seems to be very different from our usual no notion of like what's a reasonable algorithm. Because you could imagine plenty of reasonable algorithms that aren't optimal for any particular distribution but are just generally good? I would say it depends on whether you believe, uh, it depends on how strongly you believe that reality is roughly modeled by a distribution. So, I mean, if, if you believe more or less that inputs are coming from some distribution, you just don't know what it is, then, you know, if you want to use a suboptimal algorithm, fine. You know, I'm also competing with that just by transitivity. So, you're right that if you really, you know, want to use some total, totally other measure of how good an algorithm is doing, like say worst case. So if you wanted to uh, optimize the worst case performance, you definitely might well use an algorithm outside of this class. So are the algorithms that we learned in 161 and 261, do they have this property? That's a good question. Um, so. Usually, if you're worst case optimal, you're also optimal with respect to some distribution. Sure. So, like, take merge sort, right? Runs in n log n time, okay? On the other hand, like, if the array inputs are scrambled uniformly, there's a lower bound of n log n on the expected number of comparisons of any sorting algorithm. So, you may as well use merge sort. It is optimal for the uniform distribution over inputs. So in that sense, it's going to be thrown into C sub D, as will zillions of other sorting algorithms, because merge sort is not going to be optimal for other kinds of distributions. I mean, uh, partly what I'm doing here is it depends on alpha too, right? But so, I mean, if you're willing to sort of allow me small constant factors, then you may as well throw merge sort into the set. Merge sort basically will get thrown into the set, plus a lot of other stuff, okay? So that's not always true. It's not, you know, there are cases where 
optimizing the worst case gives you, you know, a fundamentally different algorithm than if you optimize with respect to a natural distribution. But, but you know, for a lot of fundamental problems, this is only going to be kind of a stronger guarantee. I mean, it is, uh, so it's instance optimality, right? So, I mean, it's in the spirit of what we we're trying to do at the beginning, where if all we wanted to do was be optimal in the worst case, you kind of learn how to do that in 161. And we want to kind of have a more input by input kind of guarantee. Well, not just on worst case inputs, but every input we want to do as well as we can. So here we're saying, okay, not, you know, as well as we can with any algorithm, but as well as any algorithm, which at least, you know, that's expected optimal in some description of reality. Is there another question? Or? Okay. Um, all right, so proof. So the proof is um, straightforward, but again, it's sort of important enough. I, let me just spell it out. Basically, instance optimality is an input by input guarantee, and this is just an on average guarantee. So if you have an approximation factor input by input, you also have it on average, no matter what distribution you're averaging with respect to. Right? So let me just actually leave it at that. Okay? Uh, so instance optimality, point-wise, only stronger than an expectation guarantee. Okay? So formally, if you really wanted to write this out, you'd say, okay, well, fix your favorite distribution, capital F. Look at the optimal algorithm for that distribution F by the, di by the definition of our set of algorithms. Okay? Opt F belongs to our set. This is defined as all of the optimal algorithms for different distributions. By the definition of instance optimality, A is at least as good up to an alpha factor, input by input, as opt F. So if you average over all the inputs, you're also at least within an alpha factor. Okay? So it's really just chaining the definitions together. How we define C sub D and what's the definition of instance optimality. Okay? So the point here, what I'm trying to say here is that now we're going to... Okay, so the connection is that thinking about unknown distributions naturally motivates a set of algorithms for which you might want to prove instance optimality, and proving instance optimality is only stronger. Okay, so again, if you think about the statement, A is instance optimal for every uh, algorithm in some set, there's no distribution in this statement. Okay, it's an input by input guarantee with respect to a set of algorithms. So we thought, we, used, we had a thought experiment about distributions just to define who we want to compete with. And never again will we ref reference a distribution over inputs. Okay? All right. So any questions about that? So that's kind of the main conceptual point of this lecture. But now I want to show you an example of why this is useful, okay? And a concrete problem. Okay. So the concrete problem I want to talk about is online decision making. Very, very well studied problem. Uh, so here's the setup. So there's a set of actions, capital A. Okay, and the problem is interesting even if A only has two options, like buy stock or sell stock today. Okay? So then here's how it works. So there's going to be T, capital T days. Think of capital T as known for lecture, although that assumption can be removed. For simplicity, think of capital T as known. So what happens on each day is you have to pick an action. By you, I mean your algorithm. It can be randomized if you want. So you pick an action A, T, on day T. And then an adversary, after you've chosen an action, or at least chosen a distribution over actions, an adversary picks a cost vector. Indicating the cost incurred by each action. And costs are going to be real numbers between 0 and 1. Okay? And our cost measure, so if we give an algorithm A, 
So an algorithm A just says, as a function of what's happened so far, what action or what distribution over actions do you pick at the next time step? An input is just a sequence of capital T cost vectors. And so the cost of an algorithm on a given input is just defined as the total cost, okay, or total expected cost if it's randomized. Okay. So we'd like this to be small, if at all possible. Now, you know, you see this description and you should say, you know, uh, doesn't this seem kind of unfair, right? Because sort of we're forced to go first and pick an action, and then the adversary gets to sort of decide how expensive the different actions are after it sees what we did, or at least whatever distribution we're going to use. And, you know, so there are some obvious and possibility results just because of the asymmetry of information between the algorithm and the adversary. So for example, it's totally hopeless to uh, try to compete with the best sequence of actions you possibly could have taken in hindsight after the capital T days, right? So for starters, like imagine your algorithm was deterministic for starters, right? So the adversaries could just like look at your algorithm and be like, okay, what are you gonna do? So they say there's two actions, right? One and two. The algorithm's gonna be like, oh, you're gonna do action two on the first day? All right, I'll make the cost of action two one, I'll make the cost of action one zero, okay? Now, I'll simulate your algorithm. Given that that happened, they're gonna look at what you do on day two. Maybe then you try action one. Okay, well then I'll make one cost one and action two cost zero, okay? If it's randomized, well, you still have to play one of the two actions with at least 50% probability. So I'll just give that one cost one and the other one cost zero, okay? Because every day I gave an action cost zero, in hindsight, there's a sequence of actions with total cost zero, okay? But you're gonna, you're gonna pay capital T, or at least an expectation, capital T over two for a randomized algorithm, okay? So that's kind of trivial, that's not interesting. And this is actually, if you think about it, this is basically a negative result for instance optimality also. Okay, if you think of instances as cost vectors, whatever algorithm you pick, okay, there's gonna be some inst input on which your total cost is high, yet some other algorithm which memorizes the optimal sequence of actions has cost zero, okay? So there's no hope for an instance optimality result without any further assumptions or restrictions. And it turns out this paradigm, this idea of sort of defining a restricted class of algorithms and doing it in this principled way of thinking about hypothetically if there was a distribution, what would you do? This turns out to be a sort of perfect way to make progress about reasoning about uh, online decision making. Okay. So this approach, this is sort of a modern way of thinking about it. This is sort of only mostly the past five years that it's been described this way, but it regenerates kind of the way people have always thought about these online decision-making problems over the past half century or so. Okay, okay so, all right, so notes can't compete with the best action sequence in hindsight. So let's do the distributional thought experiment. Okay, so again, not because we're going to assume that inputs are drawn from a distribution, but just to have a principled way of defining the algorithms we want to compete with, script C sub script D. Let's think for a second about distributions. So, question. What if it was the case that there was a distribution capital F on cost vectors? Okay, so one sample from capital F is a cost vector. So if there's two actions, it's gonna be a pair of numbers. And imagine it's IID, okay? So every single day, we have a fresh draw of a cost vector from capital F. So suppose that were true, and suppose we knew what capital F was. Think for a second about what would you do? How would you make this decision at each time step. It's actually a very simple answer, if you think about it. It sort of makes the problem degenerate, actually. Like, because you could say, okay, well, what if I picked action one? What would happen? 
Well, I guess there's some expected cost of action one according to distribution capital F, so that's what I get in expectation. And you could just think about that same computation for every available action, and there's no reason not to just pick the one with the smallest expected cost, okay? So that's what you do on day number one. Day number two, given what happened on day number one, well, who cares what happened on day number one? It's IID, right? It's the exact same question, exact same answer, right? If action seven was optimal day one, it's gonna be optimal day two, okay? So, optimal algorithm is to play the argument of the expectation where here C is drawn from F. Okay, so just every day you pick uh, the same action, the action which minimizes expectation. And because capital F is not varying with T, little t, neither is what you should do, okay? So the optimal thing is to play the same action day after day after day. Now, of course, as you vary F, the action, which is the best one to play every day, will change, okay? So now think about, so what, remember, Remember this thought experiment works. You posit a set of distributions, and then you think, you go distribution to distribution, and you say, what would I do? And then you look at the entire set of algorithms that you get. So what we just observed is that if you just specify one of these distributions F, assuming only that each T is a new fresh sample, ID from this F, then you're gonna play a fixed action. So with no other assumptions, okay, F can be arbitrarily weird. You can have correlations between the costs of different actions, doesn't matter. Ranging over all capital Fs in the world, the only algorithms you're ever going to find are the ones that play the same action every day. Okay? So in other words, uh, so thus, if script D equals all F, and again, it should be IID, so we do need to assume that, you know, each day is exactly like the previous day. Okay? You could generalize it, but today I only want to talk about the case where each day T, there's a fresh draw from the same distribution capital F. If that's your set D, then your induced set of optimal algorithms is just the fixed, meaning time invariance action sequences. Okay? So it's a very simple result of this thought experiment. We range over all distributions, we see what are the optimal algorithms, it's just the things that always play the same thing. Okay? So like if there's 10 actions, then there's 10 possible optimal algorithms for one of these distributions. Okay? So what would it mean to be instance optimal with respect to this set of algorithms? That would mean, say for some you know, factor alpha, that would mean that we have an algorithm A, okay? So that input by input, and remember an input is a sequence of t, capital T cost vectors. So we'd have an algorithm that no matter what the sequence of cost vectors is, our total cost is, at most, or at least up to a factor, at most, the best total cost achieved by any of those cardinality of A optimal algorithms in C sub D, okay? So again, if there's like 10 actions, there's 10 algorithms here, being instance optimal means that no matter what the cost vector sequence is, our total cost is essentially as good as that incurred by each of these 10 algorithms on that same input. Okay, input by input, cost vector sequence by cost vector sequence, we do at least as well as every one of these algorithms. Okay, so that's what instance optimality means for that set. Everyone with me? Okay, so it turns out what I just said is essentially exactly a very classical notion of a no regret algorithm. Okay? So I'll, I'll tell you more about that in a second. Those of you who've taken 364 from me have seen this before. But it turns out this is a, one way to think about uh, and one way to sort of motivate and automatically generate the notion of no regret algorithms. Okay? Okay, and so the main technical result of this lecture is a proof that there exists essentially instance optimal algorithms in this sense. Okay? That there actually do exist online algorithms which cost vector sequence by cost vector sequence have total cost uh, no more up to a small error of the best of those algorithms in C sub D. Okay. So any questions about kind of the setup? Yeah. So just to clarify, we, we should think about this adversary as sort of picking 
the C's in advance or something? So it's a good question. So there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a potentially important and subtle distinction between so-called oblivious adversaries and so-called adaptive adversaries. And so whether an oblivious adversary would be one that observes your algorithm, I mean, it's only relevant for randomized algorithms. Yeah. Okay, so for deterministic algorithms, it doesn't matter because I can just, you know, I can basically adapt up front, right? Because I can just simulate your algorithm and it doesn't matter. So for a randomized algorithm, it starts mattering, which is, you know, can an adversary actually observe your coin flips on day 10 and use that information to pick a cost vector uh, on day 11? And it would seem, I mean, in general, advers um, adaptive adversaries are more powerful. It turns out the algorithm we're going to stare at we're gonna, we're gonna prove guarantees about it doesn't matter. So I want you to think of it as an oblivious adversary, but the algorithm has special properties that make it also the same guarantee holds for an adaptive adversary. So I guess I just don't see how the adversary just can't pick the cost to just punish you. Good. Regardless of what you do. So the adversary absolutely can. So why is that, so the question then is why is that not a barrier to instance optimality? Yeah, basically everybody else is gonna have exactly. the same if all your competitors suck as well, this is, you know, there's nothing else you can do, okay. right? So, and this is always, I mean, so sort of then, then it punts this kind of, as we've discussed, right, we talk a lot about sort of approximation guarantees. They're not that meaningful if opt sucks. Yeah. But on the other hand, what else you're gonna do is when you're proving a theorem, right? You're not gonna do better than opt, so. Cool. But it's true, like for it to be meaningful, you also want it to be the case that in the problem that you care about opt, you'd be happy with opt, okay? But it's, it's, not, an it's not an obstacle to the theorem itself. Good question, other questions? try all T options and get punished every time, then that means that every one of the algorithms that you, you, you're competing against was punished. Uh, right, that's, that's the hope, right? So the question, so what your worry is, you know, when you try to simulate one algorithm, that you basically you have this, you're just getting all the timing wrong. Okay, and actually some of the lower bounds allows you to think about on the homework shows that this can happen, say if you use a deterministic, round, like a round robin strategy would not work, for example. If you just try to round robin simulate, we'll talk more about this, okay? So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of truth to that intuition, which is if you just do a sufficiently smart simulation of all of the options, you should do fine, because the only way you wouldn't do fine is if all of them were bad. There's definitely a grain of truth in that intuition, but really making it work technically requires some cleverness, which is why I still have a, you know, it's a good thing I still have 35 minutes of the lecture left, so. Although it is, at this point, it's been, you know, at this point, you can get optimal bounds with just insanely clever short derivations. It's kind of amazing, okay? But it does, you definitely need to be a little bit clever. Okay, so, okay. so now I wanna erase this. So everyone, I hope, remembers the setup. Capital T is the time horizon. You pick an action or distribution over actions first, then the adversary picks the cost vector. You wanna minimize the sum of the costs. And the benchmark is the best sum of the costs achieved in hindsight by an algorithm that plays exactly the same thing every single day. Those are the algorithms in script C, script D. Okay, so here's the theorem that we're gonna prove. And this is a theorem which has been sort of proved and reproved and rediscovered many times in many different decades and many different communities. So there exists a randomized algorithm and it is crucial that it's randomized. That is, so I'm gonna be a little wishy-washy with the statement uh, for the moment. It's roughly instance optimal. I'll tell you what I mean in a second. It's roughly instance optimal with respect to this set of algorithms, all of the algorithms that play the same thing every single day. With alpha roughly equal to one. I'll also say what I mean by that in a second. Uh, okay, but that's the main point. Okay, so the main point is a very strong instance optimality result. Okay, so in particular, remember our key fact, instance optimality is even better than being, is even stronger than being simultaneously optimal with respect to every distribution. So in particular, this one randomized algorithm is essentially optimal in any situation where you're so lucky as to have cost vectors being drawn IID from some distribution. Okay, that's a special case of this guarantee. It's stronger, because again, this guarantee references no distribution. But if you instantiate this algorithm when there is a distribution, then you get a good guarantee, okay? But you also get some kind of interesting guarantee even if there's no distribution, okay? Because it's instance optimal. Okay, so what do these squiggles mean? So the way we've been talking about instance optimality is we have this alpha, this multiplicative factor, okay? And it turns out for the way I've set up this problem, it's smarter to think about additive error as opposed to multiplicative error. Okay, so that's what we're gonna talk about for today. 
So we're going to have additive loss that's uh, big O of square root of capital T log N. Capital T here is the time horizon. Little n is going to always denote the number of actions. Okay? So, I mean, but again, even for two, this is interesting. Okay? But it's hold for any n. Now, okay, so again, so out of loss, this means our, the expected cost of our randomized algorithm might be worse than the best of the algorithms that always play the same thing every single day. You, you sort of, you see that that has to happen if you just, if you imagine capital T was just one, you know, sort of the only thing you can do is, you know, basically pick an action uniformly at random and you might be wrong, okay? And there was some algorithm that played the best action on that one day. So there's going to be some additive loss if you think about it. And, um, right, but so it, it's bounded. So the extent to which our total cost will be larger than the best of the fixed actions is at most this amount, root t times square root log n. Now, you look at this and you, you should think, okay, well, help me interpret this. Like, is this good? Is this bad? Or what? And in particular, the larger the time horizon, you know, this is growing. Okay, usually in these problems, you think of n as being fixed, maybe big, but you think of n as just being fixed. And then you're interested in the scaling as capital T grows, as you play the game for a longer and longer. And you sort of hope to do better, right, so that the bigger capital T is. You sh your algorithm should get smarter as it has more information about the past. It, it, somehow here it's getting worse. But so the way you should think about this is in terms of the per time step loss. Okay, so on average, over all of the plays of the game, how much worse are you doing than your best competitor? So then you divide this by capital T, and it looks much more reasonable. Okay, so square root of log n over square root t per time step. Okay? And so in particular, if you say, would like to have a guarantee, which says, well, okay, you know, I'm going to be a little bit worse, maybe, than the best fixed action in hindsight, but, you know, I just want to be, you know, like 1% worse, or 0.01 worse per day. Then you just need to take, you know, that, that's going to hold as long as your time horizon is sufficiently large. Okay, so for epsilon, you need log n over epsilon squared. Which is actually quite fast convergence. Okay. Uh, you know. So that's the right way to think about this. So this is, this is called a no-regret algorithm. And the formal definition of a no-regret algorithm is one where the, um, to the average per time step regret is going to zero as t goes to infinity, okay, for fixed n. Okay, so because we have a t in the denominator here, this is going to zero. All right, so the longer you play the game, pretty much you're converging to it's as if you knew the smartest fixed action to play in hindsight up front. And also, and I'll ask you to explore this on homework number 10, this is the best possible result you can have by any online algorithm. Okay? So both simultaneously as a function of n and as a function of capital T, there is no online algorithm, no matter how clever, which has regrets smaller than this. So that's another sense in which we should sort of appreciate this guarantee. Okay? All right, so that's the, that's the formal statement. So that's what, that's what I'm going to prove. Okay, so everyone clear on the statement? Good. So this is probably, you know, so these are the interpretations of the result, but, you know, this is probably the easier way to think about it. Okay, so just sum up all of the costs. Okay, so that's scaling, probably, with capital T, and then the extent to which our total cost is going to be bigger than the best competitor is at most root t times root log n. Now, there's actually a few algorithms which uh, achieve this guarantee. The, the, probably the best known one is, is called, among other things, multiplicative weights. That's the one that I've taught in 364, so I'm not going to teach it today. But if you're curious, you can check out, for example, my lecture notes from my class last fall. Um, that has a, that's sort of a very natural algorithm. Basically, what you do is you keep track of the past performance of all of the actions. Right, so say you're on day 100, okay, and there's like 10 actions. A natural thing to do is say, well, let's look at the previous 99 days, see how well each of these 10 actions did. By how well, I mean look at the sum of the costs you would have incurred if you'd always played action one the previous 99 days. Same thing for action two, same thing for action three. And you should be biased toward the actions which have been doing better, meaning have lower total cost. Okay, so you're going to make a randomized decision, okay, at least in the multiple weights algorithm, make a randomized decision, and it's more probable uh, that you'll pick actions that have lower cost in hindsight. So that's message one. Okay, you should pick probabilities in some sense proportional, or at least 
uh, according to past performances. The other thing which you need to get this optimal bound and which multiplicative weights does is you adapt fairly aggressively. So even if an action had been doing very well, if it starts performing poorly, you very quickly move mass off of that action and onto others. Okay, so those are sort of the two messages for multiplicative weights. Use past performance to choose your probabilities and also aggressively punish poorly performing actions. But I don't understand how if we're dealing with a truly adversarial opponent yeah. that, that using the past performance, or it's like using the past would at all influence the future. Using the past would at all influence the future. Right, like if, if are we actually assuming there's some distribution no, over this? No, definitely not. Again, the, the name of the game is just the only way the adversary can make you perform poorly in expectation is yeah. to make all of the competitors perform poorly as well. Uh, I see. Yeah. yeah. So don't forget the okay. benchmark. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Okay. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually teach you a different algorithm which has this guarantee, uh, which is also very nice uh, due to Kali and Mampala. Um, I'm going to do this second one partly just for the sake of variety, but also partly because there's a nice smooth analysis one can do of this second algorithm. So that's another connection, which I'll mention on homework 10. Okay? So there's a nice connection between this other algorithm I'm going to show you and the other concepts we've seen in the class. Yeah. Um, do we define like C of C without using adversary? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's no adversary in this definition. Yeah, so you just, you know, posit the distributions. So the adversary comes up, I mean, the adversary is sort of implicit in the definition of instance optimal, right? So this is just like a class of algorithms. Do with that what you will. But then all of a sudden when you want to start saying, oh, input by input, I want to be as good as every single algorithm. Now all of a sudden, like the way we usually think about proving those kinds of guarantees is there's some al adversary who's trying to, you know, prevent us from proving instance optimality by virtue of exhibiting this really nasty input where our algorithm sucks but someone else's is really good. Yeah, so it's really instance optimality that lends, you know, motivates the adversarial way of thinking. Yeah. But again, remember, instance optimality is just parameterized by any set of algorithms. Okay, and so, but the distributional thought experiment is just to, you know, have a well-motivated choice of which algorithm should you think about amongst, you know. Otherwise, it's sort of carte blanche, and it's hard to know, hard to know where to start. Good. All right, so... Um, before I show you the algorithm that does work, let me show you an algorithm that doesn't work. But it's very natural. So this is follow the leader. And this again is just sort of the simplest way you try to use past performance to decide what to do next. Okay. So for e on each time step, so on day one you just do something arbitrary, doesn't matter. Okay, but uh, at every subsequent day, what action do you choose? Well, you just look at each of the actions, see which ones has the smallest cumulative cost up to this point, and do that. Okay. Clear? Very natural thing to try. Uh, and, you know, it's... Uh, so on homework number 10, Turns out this is bad in the worst case. Actually, any deterministic algorithm is going to be bad in the worst case. And by worst case, I mean it's not instance optimal. Okay? I mean it does not have small regret. Okay? So it has regret growing linearly in capital T, at least for a worst case sequence of cost vectors. On the other hand, it is good in a smooth, on smooth instances. Okay? What do I mean by smooth instances? I mean, the adversary has, gets, has to pick a sequence of cost vectors up front, and then all of them get perturbed in some way. Okay? And so if all of the cost vectors, even if the adversary starts, gets to pick the initial ones, if they're perturbed, then follow the leader's fine. Okay? And that sort of follows from the analysis I'll give you for a different algorithm. Okay? So good and smooth instances. Well, it's sort of a homework, so I kind of want you to think about it. So, um, Is worst case over distributions? No, there's no distribution. Over costs, over costs vector sequences. Actually, any deterministic algorithm can be bad. So that's sort of a hint. It's not just this. It's really uh, any deterministic algorithm. So. 
I mean, in some sense, you can also, I mean, we're going to look, we're going to analyze a modified version of this algorithm. So you might want to, as we analyze the randomized version, think about where that proof would break if it wasn't randomized, if you're just doing it for this algorithm instead. So. Over, over, when you say added loss over here, this yeah. is compared with the best of the, uh, the quote-unquote natural algorithms? Exactly. So the claim is the following. For every single sequence of cost vectors, it will be the case that the expected cost of this randomized algorithm is at most, on that cost vector sequence, is at most the minimum cost of any algorithm in C sub D on that cost vector sequence up to this error term. And that's true for every single cost vector sequence. Okay. So all of the randomization we're going to be talking about is only internal. It's in the usual sense you're used to from your other algorithms classes. It's only internal coin flips made by our algorithm. Okay. There's no coin flips in the data, no randomness in the data. We really want to guarantee it's cost vector sequence by cost vector sequence. Okay. All right. So. Instead, we're going to look at a perturbed version of follow the leader. And um, here's how it works. So basically, we're going to do follow the leader, but we're just going to sort of initialize it randomly. And that's good enough, actually. Okay. So as a pre-processing step, before we even look at the first cost vector, we award to each action a random bonus, okay? And lots of distributions for the random bonus would work, but the analysis is particularly simple if we look at a geometric random variable with parameter epsilon. So what I mean is, for action number one, you do the following experiments. You start flipping coins. And the coin has a probability epsilon. We'll choose epsilon later. Think of it epsilon as small, though. Uh, it has an epsilon probability of coming up heads. So you keep flipping until you get a heads. And then you just count how many coin flips you needed to get a heads. Okay? So if there's a probability of epsilon of getting a heads, what's like the expectation of this random variable? One over epsilon. Right? Obviously, the smaller the probability of heads, the more coin flips it takes to get one. And it's one over epsilon for geometric. Okay? And we do that exact same experiment independently for each of the actions. So each action gets its own random bonus. Okay. So number of coin flips to get heads, where the probability of heads is epsilon. Okay. And now we just do follow the leader with these random bonuses. Okay. So now we just set our action to be the one that minimizes the same thing, past performance, minus the number of coin flips it took to get heads. OK? So everybody starts with some like negative total cost. And it's random for different people. Uh, and then you just accumulate the real cost from then on. Okay, so it's a single perturbation at the very beginning. And that's it. Does the algorithm clear? Okay. So the claim is that algorithm satisfies this theorem. Okay. And the proof, the analysis is very clever. So analysis. So again, remember, we're shooting for an input by input guarantee. Okay, so fix an input arbitrarily. Okay, so fix C1, C2, C capital T. Okay, as I said, think about an oblivious adversary that has to fix the sequence up front. Although actually, if you think about it just so, one can realize that the guarantee extends even for an adaptive adversary. Okay, but think about an oblivious adversary. So it fixes, so the adversary sees our algorithm in effect and devises the worst cost vector sequence it can think of. So for the analysis only, we're going to define a fictitious algorithm, okay, an algorithm we could never implement. Okay? But it's going to be useful for the proof nonetheless. So define fictitious algorithm A by 
So what it does is it does the same thing as perturbed follow the leader. Sorry, I, this is wrong. So perturbed follow the leader, right, so at the time of day t, the information it has is the first t minus one cost vectors, right? So the only thing, right, so this is what I meant to write, okay, s less than t. Right, so it uses all the information that it has, which of course is only from the past, to make its decision, okay? This algorithm capital A, it's going to also make use on day t of the cost vector at d day t, okay? Now, of course, no online algorithm in our model actually knows the cost vector at time t when it makes the decision at time t. But for the proof, let's think about this fictitious algorithm which could sort of look ahead one step, okay? All right, so it sets a t to be argmin of sum over all s up to and including day t, implausibly, and again with the random bonuses. Okay? And so again, for emphasis, we could not implement this algorithm for proof purposes only. Okay? All right, why did I do this? Well, this turns out to be a really useful intermediate object to argue about. So let me tell you the three claims, which together imply the theorem that I'm erasing. So three claims. First of all, with probability one, the regret of this fictitious algorithm A, and what do I mean by regret? I mean the total cost of A, Okay, so the sum over little t of c t a t. So cost of A minus cost of best fixed action. So that's what I mean by regret. The claim is that this is at most the biggest of the perturbations. Okay, so remember x of A is the number of coin flips until I get heads. Okay? So we have this parameter epsilon, which we haven't specified yet. Okay? Right, but as the as epsilon gets smaller and smaller and smaller, so the likelihood of a heads is smaller and smaller, the sizes of these x sub a's is going to be getting bigger and bigger. Okay? So the right hand side here is getting bigger as epsilon gets small. Okay? Notice actually that if all the x sub a's were zero, okay? So if you think about this, so this was probably one, okay? And the randomization is over the the only thing that's random is these perturbations, right? So like, the claim is that this is true even if all the x sub a's are zero, okay? So when x sub a is zero, perturbed follow the leader is exactly the same as follow the leader, okay? So a special case of what we're proving here is that if there are no perturbations, then the regret of algorithm A, i.e. follow the leader, where you additionally are thinking about the cost vector t, Okay, you're sort of cheating and adding t. Uh, that's at most the cost of the um, of the best solution. Okay. All right. So that's the first claim. Second claim is that yeah, we're cheating. So what do we do? So what's the difference between pertur from from perturbed follow the leader, PFTL, and A? The difference is that we added the current day's cost vector into the computation. That's the only difference between the two algorithms. Okay? So we're cheating. You know, we're looking ahead into the future by day. But the claim is that cheating doesn't actually matter much for the cost computation. Okay, so the claim is that the expected regret of an algorithm that we can implement, perturbed follow the leader, is at most the regret of this algorithm that we can't implement, A. Okay, it's not quite as good, but it's only going to be off by epsilon times capital T. Okay? So epsilon sort of difference per time step. Right, so in, in step one, the smaller epsilon was, the bigger the x sub a's, so the bigger our loss. But in step two, as we bring epsilon down, actually the, the less loss that we're doing. Okay? So for step one, we want epsilon to be big. For step two, we want epsilon to be small. 
And then the final claim, which is quite simple, is that it's very easy to understand how big this is going to be as a function of epsilon. Okay. So in expectation, the biggest of the perturbations is going to be logarithmic in the number of actions divided by epsilon. Okay. So remember, the expected value of one of these, as we said, is 1 over epsilon. Okay, so we have a bunch of things. Their, their expectations are 1 over epsilon. We have n of them. The biggest of those n is going to be like log n bigger. Okay, log n over epsilon. So let me just uh, point out that these three claims imply the theorem. So upshot, if we chain these together, the expected regret of perturbed follow the leader, so we chain all three of these together, is at most, um, right, right, so this regrets at most that, and then we pick up an additional epsilon t, and that's just that. So this is going to be at most epsilon t plus O of log n over epsilon. Epsilon, remember, is a parameter of our choosing. Right? So our follow up with the perturbed leader is just uh, parameterized by epsilon, so we should set it to balance these terms. And so this is just O of root t log n with the judicious choice of epsilon equal to log n over square root of log n over t. Okay. So this is why assuming claims 1, 2, and 3, we get the desired theorem. This was exactly the loss bound claimed in the theorem. Okay. Questions about that? I mean, so I'll you the proofs of these. But other than that, any questions? Okay. Uh, so let me, let me address the claims in reverse order. This is straightforward, okay? So like we said, it's the expectation of one thing is one over epsilon. You have n of them, the max is a log n factor bigger. You've seen a lot of statements like that. I'm gonna put this on as an exercise on homework number 10. Okay, literally you just compute the probability that the geometric random variable is sufficiently large and take a union bound and you're pretty much done, okay? So that's easy. Claims one and two are not uh, especially difficult, but they're very clever, okay, very clever proofs. Okay, so let me prove two and then prove one. All right, proof of two. All right, so we want to show that the regret, so let's, let's just keep in mind what the difference between these two algorithms are, okay? So in both of these algorithms, they pre-process the same way with these random bonuses, these x sub a's. And then at every time step, they pick the action which minimizes the cumulative cost so far plus the random bonus. The only difference being that a uses day t's cost vector in its computation. Okay, so it uses the first t cost vectors. P, perturbed follow the leader, is a real algorithm, so it only uses the first t minus one cost vectors. Okay? But we want to say the expected difference in regret is at most epsilon t. So we're, we're going to prove actually that the difference in the expected costs of the two algorithms is at most epsilon t. Okay, so they have almost the same cost, so therefore they have almost the same regret. Actually, we're going to prove something even stronger than that. We're going to prove on almost every single day, the two algorithms do exactly the same thing. Okay? So we're going to prove that for every single day t, with probability, the probability that they do something different is at most epsilon. Remember the costs, I've assumed, are between zero and one. Okay? So if you do something different, it at most introduces a cost of one, a, a difference in one in your costs. Okay? So if in only an epsilon fraction of the days, you do things different, that translates to a difference in only epsilon t in your cost, okay? expected cost. So that's what I'm gonna prove. Okay? So for every t, every day t, the probability that they do something different from each other is the most epsilon. Okay? So claim, all right, so fixed AT. Now here's another sort of 
trivial but very nice observation. Okay? What can you tell me? And so again, we want to prove on a given day t, these two algorithms are going to do very likely exactly the same thing. What can you tell me about the action that PFTL plays on day t versus the action that our fictitious algorithm plays the previous day on day t minus 1? It's the same. Okay? So on day t, perturbed follow the leader, right? They're using the same random bonuses, okay? Or the same you know, distribution of random bonuses. PFTL, what does it do? It uses all the information it has. Okay, the first t minus one cost vectors, and it picks the best one. Okay? The day before, A already knew that information, right? And it used all of that information to make a decision. Okay? All right. So the probability that these two actions do something different on day t is the same as the probability that algorithm A does something different on consecutive days. Okay? So now what we want to prove is this, this fictitious algorithm on the right, if we look at an arbitrary pair of consecutive days, t minus 1 and t, we want to argue that with probably at least 1 minus epsilon, it, proves this, it, it picks the same action both days. Okay? That's what claim 2 has been reduced to. Okay, so why is that true? So, um, let me tell you a sufficient condition for that. Okay? So suppose we're at day t minus 1, because we're thinking about the fictitious algorithm. We're curious about whether it switches actions between day t minus 1 and day t. Suppose on day t minus 1, there's a big difference between the best action and the second best action. Okay? By big difference, I mean the cumulative cost so far plus the random bonuses is strictly bigger than one difference. Okay? But say the best action is action number seven. Its score, its random bonus plus cumulative cost is 124. And the next best one is like 121.5. Okay? Well then we're definitely picking action seven tomorrow. Right? Costs are between zero and one, remember. Okay? So the gap in the cumulative cost between two actions can only narrow by one in a given day. Okay, in the worst case, action seven had cost one, the second best action had cost zero, and the cumulative cost gets closer together by one. But if a day t minus one, it was already out-competing the other one by strictly bigger than one, then we're definitely going to play it the next day as well. Okay? So where do we stand? Now what we need to prove, we need to prove that on a given day, or it's sufficient to prove that if we look at a given day, the first best action is much better than the second best action with probably at least one minus epsilon. Okay? So let me prove that to you. All right. So fix a day t. All right. And um, so we're going to use the principle of deferred decisions to do this. Okay. So define so let c sub a be the cumulative costs not counting the random bonuses. Okay. Feels like you're making uh, the analysis by assuming um, the difference between the best cost function and the second best cost function um, is independent each day. No, so I, I want to make the no. So ultimately, there'll be a linear of expectations application. So I don't care about independent. I don't need independence across days. So all I'm asserting is pick your favorite day t or your favorite consecutive pair of days t minus one and t. I just want to say it doesn't matter what t is. It's just going to be the case of probably at least one minus epsilon. You play the same thing both days. Okay? So then by our, our previous equivalence, that says that PFTL and A play the same thing with probably at least one minus epsilon. I they play different things with probably most epsilon. So that means in a given day t, the expected difference in cost is at most epsilon. And so now I just sum over the days, and that's just a linearity of expectation computation. So you're absolutely correct in the objection that different days are not independent of each other, but it just doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah. Good question. All right, so just to remind you, what are we doing? We're trying to say, we're considering the fictitious algorithm. Actually, at this point, it doesn't matter, but it's the fictitious algorithm. We've fixed a day t. There's some best action. There's some second best action. We want to say that the difference between their cumulative cost plus random bonuses at this given time is very likely to be bigger than one. Now, I want to use the principle of deferred decisions. Okay, so that means I want to sort of flip the random coins only as I need them. 
And so let's start with no random coins at all being flipped. Okay, so for, uh, it's, it's almost like think of the bonuses as zero for the moment. Okay? So that gives us these capital C sub A's. All right, so the picture, so say there's like four actions. Okay, so there's action one. So here C sub A is going up. Okay. I guess it should be indexed by T also. So the given day T. Okay. So these are whatever they are. Okay. So remember, the adversaries fixed some cost function sequence, so they're just are these numbers at day T, whatever they are. Okay. And we haven't flipped the coins for the random bonuses yet. Okay. Now, if we were just playing normal follow the leader, we'd choose this one. Right? We'd choose the smallest. Now in perturbed follow the leader, we may not choose this one, right? Because all of these are going to get sort of shifted down by random amounts. And we're going to pick the one which after the random subtraction is the minimum. So here's what we're going to do, okay? We're going to flip the coins lazily, only as needed, to figure out which action perturbed follow the leader is actually going to take at day t, day t okay? So here's what we do. We start with the worst action, all right? And we start trying to figure out what this guy's random bonus is by flipping these coins. Okay, remember, we flip a coin. If we get tails, we subtract one. Okay? And then we repeat the whole experiment. It's memoryless. Okay, if it's heads, then, we're, then we stop. So we flip a coin for the worst action first. If it's heads, then we can definitely exclude this action from further consideration. All right, everybody's only going down. So if this guy stops bigger than the other ones, it's definitely not going to be picked as the minimum this, this day. Okay? So we start flipping coins, okay? But maybe, you know, maybe we keep getting tails, okay? So we keep like getting better and better lower bounds on the random bonus of this person. And all of a sudden it's in a tie with the next best action. So now what we're gonna start doing is we're gonna start flipping coins for both of these each. So it's almost like a runoff, okay? And these are gonna get subtracted, okay? So we flip coins. This is how we're determining the bonuses. As soon as we get heads for something, we can discard it. Okay? So it's kind of this race, right? We have this coin flipping race where some people, you know, have these, you know, where they have different starting positions depending on the C sub A's. Okay? Now at some point, we'll have figured out, you know, which one is the best one. All right? So like imagine, you know, it comes down to a race between action two and action four. Right, so these guys, you know, their head was, you know, the head was flipped and they were still really bad. And sort of, you know, we're going back and forth, you know, a tete a tete between actions two and four. You know, we got a tails, we got a tails. Then we get another tails, we get another tails. Right, we keep going back and forth. And at some point, right, we're going to get a heads on one of them. Right, say this one. Okay? So this guy's done. Right? We actually know the random bonus plus cumulative cost of this action four. Action two... Right? So we've determined that this will be the smallest, but we haven't actually determined what its random bonus is. We've only determined a lower bound on its random bonus. Okay? So to fully sample action two's random bonus, we have to keep flipping coins. Right? And what if we get a tails on the next one? If we get a tails on the next one, this guy's actually gonna wind up not just less than action four, he's already less than action four. One more tails, this person's strictly more than one less than action four. Okay? All we need is one more tails. And that happens with probably one minus epsilon. Okay? So that's how you do it. Right? So first you think of the random bonuses as zero. You just sort them by the cumulative costs at day t without the random bonuses. Flip coins lazily to figure out which guy's the winner, the smallest, and then keep flipping. Okay? And the only bad case is if you get a heads immediately after determining which action happens to be the minimum. Okay? All right. So done by principle of deferred decisions plus linearity of expectation. Right. So that's claim two. Okay, so that's one of the super, that's super clever two claims. All right, so claim one. Yeesh. All right, so claim two, claim one is a quite simple computation. So first, assume, right. So I'm claiming this no matter what the random bonuses are. 
Okay, so this is where we, this is really where the genius of the definition of the fictitious algorithm comes up. Okay, so we're saying that the regret, so what did we want? We cared about the regret of follow the perturbed leader. We had no idea how to analyze that. We did understand by the last claim how to at least tether the regret of perturbed follow the leader to this other fictitious algorithm A. Turns out algorithm A is something whose regret we can get a handle on directly. Okay, and that was really the point of the definition of A. So, in what sense can we get a handle on it? We want to say it's regret is at most the biggest perturbation. Let me show you the, let me just, to, to sort of clarify things, let's assume all the XA's are zero. Okay? In which case, algorithm A is just follow the leader with this one extra cost vector. Okay, it's not perturbed. So in that case, I need to show you that the regret's at most zero. Okay? So follow the leader with omniscience for one extra day is as good as the best fixed action in hindsight. Okay? So suppose the XA is equal zero. Then, all right, so, right, so let x a star be best fixed, and let a1 up to at be a's actions. Okay, so this is our competitor, the cost of a star day after day after day, and then our algorithm, algorithm capital A, incurred these costs. So let's begin with our competitor. Right, so we want to say our cost is at least as good as this, if we're doing follow the leader with the one extra piece of information each time step. So we want a lower bound. Okay? All right, so what can you tell me about the relationship between A star, the best fixed action in hindsight, and A t, when the perturbations all happen to be zero? So let me just remind you what the uh, in perturbed follow the leader, how did, we how did we decide things? We took the argmin with the random bonuses, which we're currently assuming is zero. Okay, so ignore these. Plus, sum up over all the days, including today, of the, whoops. So this was the decision rule that perturbed follow the leader used. Okay, so look at all the days up to today. Okay, so it's fictitious. And pick the best one, cumulative cost up to today. So what can you tell me about the relationship between A star and A capital T, assuming all the XA's are zero? AT is, gets to choose a different action each time. Oh, so you're jumping ahead. That's pretty much the whole proof, actually. Yeah. But let's just focus on the very last one, A capital T. Oh, the final Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, but you're right. Then, then they're equal. Exactly. So A capital T actually equals A star when the x's are all zero. Okay? A star, by definition, is the best action in hindsight. If you stare at this and take little t equal capital T, you realize this is also just the best action in hindsight. Okay? But let me just, you know, write it this way as an inequality even though it's an equality, okay? So basically, A superscript capital T is chosen so that this is true. It's chosen to optimize this, okay? So it can only be better. So now let me just peel off, continuing this derivation, let me peel off the last term. All right, so this is just rewriting the left hand, the right hand side. Whoops, minus one, okay? So what's going to happen if instead of, if I substitute A capital T here with A capital T minus 1? You can only get that. Can only get, it can only get smaller. Right, so if you look at the decision rule of the algorithm, at every time step it's picking the thing that minimizes the cumulative cost up to that point. Okay? So if I replace this capital T with a T minus 1, this only gets smaller. So that's by the choice of a t minus one. Okay, a t minus one was chosen to make that sum as small as possible. Okay, so it's no bigger than if a capital T was there. Now I do the same thing. I just peel off that t minus one term. Okay, so that leaves me with a sum over the first capital t minus two days. I substitute in a to the superscript t minus two. That's only better by the choice of a t minus two, and so on. Okay, so at the end of the day, 
what you get, you just get the sum of all these peeled off terms, which is just sum over the days of CT of AT. Okay? Also known as the cost incurred by the PTFL algorithm, sorry, PFTL algorithm in the special case where the x's are zero. Okay? And actually, it turns out, and because I'm out of time, I won't do this for you, but it'll be very easy for you to do yourself. If with arbitrary x's, all that happens is in every inequality in this derivation, okay, you lose a little bit, okay? Because in general now, it's not the case that, uh, you know, this is at least as good as this. Maybe the algorithm got misled by the perturbations. And remember, we expect some error in this step because of the perturbations. Maybe it's the case that you didn't choose, you know, the best thing. You didn't choose A star because A star got a small random bonus and your A capital T got a big random bonus. So there's going to be some error here, and it's going to be just the difference in the bonuses between A star and A capital T. That's all that matters. So you get one extra difference of two bonuses. You get a difference of two bonuses in every single inequality. You add up all of those loss terms. You get a very elegant telescoping sum of differences. And at the end of the day, this exact derivation holds modulo one difference between two bonuses. That's the only difference. Okay? And so the difference between two bonuses, they're both non-negative, so that's bounded above by the biggest bonus of them all, and that's what we need to prove. Okay. So that, that concludes the proof of the theorem. All right. So um, sometimes I do top 10 lists at the end of the class, but I'm already over time, so I think I'll just post a top 10 list uh, uh, on the website in, in the future. Um, you've learned a ton of uh, concepts in the course, and I know it's sometimes hard to keep track of the overarching narrative, but, uh, and all of the various connections, for example, between IID distributions and synoptimality and all this other stuff, um, but out of time. So I would be remiss if I didn't thank Rishi, who I think you'll agree is a totally killer TA. So thanks to Rishi, thanks to all of you. It's been a lot of fun, so.